some questions here to consider as we go through and learn about the coca cola ization of the world. Coca-Cola-ization of the world, or globalization through Coca-Cola. So before we get started, I just want to talk about one of the uh, one of the things you're going to be asked to be doing throughout the year with world history, and we're really going to focus on it this year, is change over time, and really what's called continuity and change over time. So as you look at the bottles across the top there, as you spread from the clear bottle that just says property of coca-cola all the way to the right where you see the red coca-cola aluminum bottle the glass to plastic to aluminum the different colors the different logo I want you to just look at that quickly here and think about this what is similar what stayed the same throughout history what has changed what's different Think about those sorts of things and try to wrap your head around it. So what would you come up with? Let's also look here, and you've got a chance to see at least, a good chance to see from 94 to the summer of 09-10, the Coca-Cola can. What parts of the can have stayed the same and what parts have changed? What is similar with each of those? What's different? Obviously the color red shows up uh, quite a lot at the bottom there from 1886 all the way through the current coca-cola logo you see examples of each of them what's similar what's different about them um, what has stayed the same throughout the history of the company and what has changed thinking in this way is really important to get wrap your mind around that as you're studying history to be constantly thinking what have I studied in this unit that has stayed the same what throughout the unit that's pretty similar what have I studied in this unit that has changed remarkably and I can really look at it and say well that's a turning point things are different there than they were in the past we're not going to get into all that here we'll do some of that in class on the the continuity and um, change of these logos and bottles and cans the other one here to think about is that jolly old red man, not this jolly old red uh, guy, but uh, Santa Claus himself holding the Coca-Cola uh, bottle. There's a reason that you see Santa Claus in a lot of the Coca-Cola ads and still do. There's a reason that it's so popular, and the biggest reason is the marketing and commercialization of Coca-Cola as a product. So think about these questions as you go through the presentation. Hopefully you'll understand those by the end. Industrial strength. 1886, John Pemberton sold about nine Coca-Colas a day. And how did he sell them? It was a fountain drink, basically. You see the top picture there, Jacob's Pharmacy Branch, which is basically where he was mixing these concoctions together. Um, today, this soft drink is, is one of the world's most valuable brands sold in more countries than the United Nations has members. It may be second, the second most widely understood phrase in the world after OK, Coke. So that really says something about the strength of this brand. The drink has become a symbol of America, whether you love it or hate it. And Standage notes that East Germans quickly reached for Cokes when the Berlin Wall fell. And we'll see some pictures of that and think about it. While Thai Muslims uh, poured it out into the streets to show disdain for the United States in the days leading up to the 2003 invasion of Iraq. Coca-Cola encapsulates what happened in the 20th century, and that's really what this is about. It's a great example of what we'll study in history in the last uh, unit and this is going to be in May um, or April I'm sorry 
uh, leading up to April. We'll have mostly all of May and most of April to prepare for the AP test. But the last units are about, uh, and we'll be talking about chapters 23 and 24, essentially the globalization and the global economy. Coke is globalization in a bottle, except that that bottle is a little bit more expensive than the five cent glass that you could get at the drugstore when you'd sit down for maybe a sandwich and a Coca-Cola or a candy or something. Um, when countries were polled for happiness, as defined by the UN index, high scores correlated and went together with availability of Coca-Cola. Analysis, because people who drink Coca-Cola must just be happier people. Correlation does not mean causation. That's something we'll learn in AP Psychology. But what it does mean is that where Coca-Cola is available, there's probably a free market economy, a dynamic economy, possibly freedoms for people who are living there. And they'll probably be happier because of that. So the creation myth of Coca-Cola and how it got started. Stronger, stronger, grow they all. Who for Coca-Cola call? Brighter, brighter, thinkers think when they Coca-Cola drink. This is 1896 advertising slogan and it's the spreading of this drink and getting it out there into people's mind. You can almost hear this um, as, as you'd be reading it on a sign or uh, seeing an advertisement for it. But similar to the other drinks, Coca-Cola initially is a, a medicinal beverage and it really is thought to be. And Pemberton was kind of like a quack um, shyster who would mix up these concoctions and sell them and say this is going to cure your diseases. What he had been doing for a long time is mixing together these kind of potion type things and selling them in the pharmacy. This is going to solve your problems with headache or um, problems with uh, digestion or whatever. Well, another drink became pretty popular around this time based upon a French wine and using coca from the Incas and this coca plant and you know if you chew the coca leaves what ends up happening you chew enough of that it gets a little bit of what is really cocaine into your system which would speed your system up you might feel better although be pretty addictive he also used the cola nut an extra extract from the cola nut however he needed a non-alcoholic version of all of this, and initially it was the French wine version, whenever the temperance movement or the prohibition started in um, the uh, early 1920s. So thanks to advertising and marketing and using testimonials, a distinctive logo, lots of free samples and taste tests, those kind of things, the syrup that they would sell to these places that would uh, uh, create it, they put the carbonation into it and sell it, became um, being added to lots of soda fountains and by 1895 it's a, a national drink. People across the country can get their hands on a Coca-Cola if they wish. It had some legal controversy involving the claims that it was um, a cure-all and they finally focused in on delicious and refreshing. And you'll see that in quite a few of these ads here as we move along. Travel refreshed I say um, ice cold Coke is what it takes to travel refreshed. Try it. You'll like it. And today, these kind of ads, you know, you don't see those very often, but that those worked back then. Um, caffeine for all. Okay. This is real interesting, uh, but there was a trial involving Coca-Cola being sued by Harvey Washington Wiley, who's a government scientist. He blamed caffeine in the product as being harmful and harmful contents and coca-cola was saying hey we just have a refreshing drink here this is not a drug is caffeine a drug it definitely is a drug it has drug-like qualities and we'll look at that here in a, in a bit with caffeine and i think we saw a little bit of that with the co with the with the coffee and the, and the tea that we've already mentioned but that's something that pemberton's company had on its side coffee and tea already had um the stimulant in it, caffeine. And so in a way, people were sort of used to that and didn't view it as a drug. Anyway, 
they were advertising to children and showing babies or kids drinking Coca-Cola. And that's where Wiley had a big problem with this, and that's why he went through and, and did sue them. Coca-Cola won the lawsuit in the end, but was forced to cut the amount of caffeine in half. And they were also not to advertise to children. Earlier, I think we mentioned you know chewing on uh, the coca leaves would give you a bit of cocaine. There was a slight, tiny bit of potential cocaine uh, residue in some of the early drinks of Coca-Cola. And there was there were cocaine-laced drinks that were sold in some of these pharmacies, you know, back then legally because they didn't realize what cocaine was like. But it never had, like, cocaine as a main ingredient. It was kind of a byproduct of it in some ways. Today, there's certainly not any in <laughs> Coca-Cola at all. There's still some coca and some cola extract. And this special formula that the Coca-Cola people have uh, certainly puts that to use, but it's mostly, you know, a lot of sugar to make up for that to give it its taste. Coca-Cola may have refined the popularized Jolly Santa look, but they didn't create the look. In fact, a lot of people believe that myth that it's Coca-Cola that created the Jolly Fat Santa. They didn't really create it, but they took it to another level. Um, it, the advertisements were so massive and so many of them around Christmas time with Coca-Cola that that symbol of what Christmas was to kids was pretty important. And did you catch that there? Not allowed to advertise to children. And they don't until 1986. Well, that's when I was a kid. I was 16 in 1986. Some of you will turn 16 this year. Um, so maybe that maybe that's why I'll have a Diet Coke sitting on my desk sometimes. They advertise straight to me. Uh, they advertise straight to you too. But Coca-Cola found ways of advertising by using Santa to get to the kids without having kids in there. Although if you look at that doll there and, and it says me too, <laughs> I, I don't know. They, that kind of creeps me out a little bit, but that's sort of like a childlike thing. Well, in the 1930s, they were pretty difficult for the company and difficult for a lot of companies in, around the world, as we'll study the Great Depression then. But the end of prohibition, meaning now that alcohol is going to be a competitor against Coca-Cola, the Wall Street crash of 1929 was certainly a problem economically, the Great Depression, massively important across the entire country, and then the rise of Pepsi, uh, PepsiCo and its rival drink, Pepsi-Cola. And now you've got that two... Uh, competitors getting after it. And what I think happens when there's two competitors like this is they force each other to make a better quality product and competition is really not a, a bad thing overall. But Coca-Cola wins the Pepsi, uh, Pepsi battles and they've been winning them still. They're still a stronger company than Pepsi. But there is some opportunities for Pepsi and we'll see a couple here. If anyone were to ask us what we were fighting for we think half of us would answer the right to buy Coca-Cola again. This is a letter home from World War II. And Coca-Cola has these in their Coca-Cola museum and they're on display and, and things like that. But this is a popular sentiment for soldiers fighting in Europe. They're thinking about the American way of life. What's the American way? It's being able to sit down with friends and have a Coca-Cola. Again, remember, this is a caffeinated beverage, so we're not talking about alcoholic beverage becoming so popular, and it is driving an economic engine of the new American superpower, who after World War I and World War II will be the lone, really big lone superpower in the world. The Soviet Union also very, very competitive for a while, at least it seemed that way. Today, there's really one superpower in the world, and it's the United States of America. A lot of people want to think that China is surpassing America, but they're nowhere close, especially in terms of quality of living and, and the way um, America is today. Are they catching up? Certainly. We'll talk much more about that in class. But this is the birth of the American century, the 20th century. So Coke sought to increase soldier morale, and those 16 million servicemen that went out into the world with Coca-Cola in their hand you liberate a country in Europe and Coca-Cola is going to be spread. But Coca-Cola was already in Europe before the war. And we'll see a little bit of that here in a, a slide that comes up here in a minute. Bottling plants were set up specifically wherever servicemen were stationed 
so that it made it easier for them to be able to get the product into the hands of servicemen. After the war, there were attacks of coca colonization by the French communists in the midst, midst of the, uh, the Cold War. Coca-Cola was the essence of capitalism, and if you're a communist and you're fighting against that, you are also then going to say you don't want to have anything to do with Coca-Cola, which is synonymous with and uh, is understood to be um, a capitalist company and one that symbolizes America. It's interesting how Coca-Cola became marketed in Israel and then the Arab world becomes dominated by Pepsi. That's also really interesting. The backlash against America and Coca-Cola, yet Pepsi didn't have the same strong link of symbolism with America. American drink, but it isn't Coke. It's not Coca-Cola and it didn't have that same cachet or uh, impact. Coca-Cola's history is an example of global processes at work. Industrialization, like we talked about with uh, tea. Mass transportation. You're going to have to get this product out to people all around the world. Mass consumerism. You've got people in countries all over the world who buy Coca-Cola daily. Global capitalism on a scale that's never been seen before. Massive world conflict. And this massive world conflict is opening up markets when America is victorious for this product to, to, to be moving. The Cold War, which is this um, ideological battle with the Soviet Union, communism and, uh, and democracy and capitalism kind of fighting things out. And those ideological battles uh, were part of this new global, global world that Coca-Cola was a part of. So you see uh, Coca-Cola in uh, four different or, excuse me, three different places. The left-hand side here is, of course, the Great Wall of China, and that's the that's means Coca-Cola in Chinese. And you can see that same logo here is on both of these advertisements. It's interesting behind them. This is sort of like a a Chinese uh, symbol, uh, like a Chinese New Year type symbol, that sort of thing. But it also looks a little bit to me like a basketball in some ways. And basketball very popular in China as well. At the bottom with the camel in northern Africa and also in the Middle East, Coca-Cola being uh, drunk there. And here at the top, see if anybody can figure out where this one might be from. Any ideas? Refreshco. That'd be Mexican Coke, which today is actually pretty popular in America because it has that old-fashioned sugar base that people seem to, to love. I'm going to show a couple of ads here, and I'll insert these in the video as we go. This first one's called the Hilltop Ad and Buy the World of Coke. This is an extremely successful advertisement. It gives you an example of the power of television advertising to uh, further the brand and cement in at least American minds. What it was, and I, this is actually a world ad because it, it was filmed in Italy. It gives you a sense to understand what Coca-Cola's goals were. I'd like to buy the world a home and furnish it with love. Grow apple trees and honeybees and snow white turtle doves. I'd like to teach the world to sing. Sing with me. This picture at the top left shows Bill Clinton and Hillary Clinton drinking Coca-Cola and anybody want to guess what country they're drinking it in. That would be Russia. So the same uh, logo here, and this is for the 1980 Olympic Games, Russian Coca-Cola. Uh, at the bottom here, Japan and the robot Coca-Cola machine. 
course here again and you see the the logo here for the Chinese uh, and their version of coca-cola Mexican coke here at the top and it's often accompanies Mexican coke accompanies some uh, Mexican restaurants in America you can get a Mexican coke with your Mexican food it's kind of interesting at the bottom here a number of different countries mostly Asian and a couple European coca-cola capitalism and really advertisements are what uh, a lot of people think of you can't watch the Super Bowl without seeing a massive coca-cola ad or a whole number of them that are kind of creating a new story and some of them have nothing to do with coca-cola like the polar bears but for some reason they're just trying to get that ad out and uh, and make people feel good when they're seeing a coca-cola symbol there here are professional football players mostly with the very successful Cleveland Browns of that era and each of them have a coca-cola in hand um, here's one of the early six-pack bottle containers I could just picture these things rattling like crazy in there uh, this looks like a 1920s or 30s ad potentially uh, the Simpsons down here, this was an ad just a couple years ago that was in the Super, uh, Super Bowl. And a very, very famous ad, the Mean Joe Green ad. I'm from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. I remember that ad very, very well, and here it is. Please, please, give him out. Mr. Green? Mr. Green? Yeah. You, you need any help? Mm -mm. I, I just want you to know, I think, I think, you're the best ever. Yeah, sure. Want my Coke? It's okay, you can have it. No, no. Really, you can have it. Okay. A Coke and a smile Makes me feel good Makes me feel nice year round. That's the way it should be so the whole have a coke and a smile it all seems wonderful doesn't it this is a great story not so fast uh, coca-cola like many other massive companies have a few dark side secrets that they would rather you not know about. If you look here, it says behind Coca-Cola on the left side, the hidden face of your favorite drink. Each second, more than one million liters are lost by glaciers around the world. We are in the middle of the greatest uh, warming of the globe that we have seen since humans have populated the globe um, in certainly modern times. And what we're seeing with Coca-Cola is a company that needs a massive amount of water to bottle and to put its product on shelves and transport it around the world. The consumption of this product leads to a massive amount of waste, which we'll talk about in the next section here at the epilogue with bottled water. It's the same kind of thing. The plastics and the bottling and the cans, these are an incredible amount of waste every year. So there's some statistics there that give you some ideas about the different kinds of drinks. The one that really jumps out to me is the bottom right hand side there. It says there are nearly 10,450 different soft drinks from the Coca-Cola company. Consumed every second of every day including Diet Coke and Fanta and Sprite which are their most popular ones. If you were to try to drink all of those different kinds of brands just 10,450 different drinks that would take you like forever to drink them all I mean it, there's so many different ones you could have a different coca-cola product every single day of your life and you'll probably never finish them all I mean it's, it's pretty amazing only three people know of the coca-cola recipe um, and there's some other interesting stats down here on the left hand side uh, you see that small cup of Coca-Cola is equal to seven cubes of sugar. Um, the two liter, 42 cubes of sugar. Uh, Coke may risk your increased, uh, give you an increased sense of obesity, 60% uh, uh, chance to be obese if you drink Coca-Cola. 
coal company invest two billion dollars into advertising worldwide so they are making sure that their product is out there in front of consumers so that it almost uh, forces them into the choice that they make what am i going to drink today here's a, 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 a kind of a look here uh, editorial comment about what coca-cola is doing to southeast asia which is pulling the water drinking the water right out from under the native population in many cases that's what they're doing when they put a, a bottling plant in that can certainly happen so let's talk about more about globalization and how this really fuels and, and goes forward um, when you're looking at um, the world changing in world war ii coca-cola is already on the shelves of stores and places in germany before world war ii so 1936 olympic games very famous olympics known as the hitler olympics coca-cola is a part of that um, you can see two different ads there trink coca-cola it's in german at the bottom this is a cold war encounter between the president of the united states and the dark suit there in the middle president nixon then vice president nixon he later returns um, as president and the Soviet premier Khrushchev, Khrushchev, sorry, who they're drinking Pepsi there. Now they've kind of colorized this to make sure you can see it, and I'm not sure. I know it wasn't a color picture, but it gives you the sense that it, and it was Pepsi that they were drinking. Um, Dick Nixon actually worked as a head of the company of Pepsi, and he did that after he lost the governor race in California. So this is a person who. You know, the ties between politics and the government and consumerism and capitalism were pretty strong. So Coca-Cola Coca colonization is a term, and many times a derisive term, meaning that the world's being colonized by uh, an imperial power, the United States, and companies like Coca-Cola, uh, these huge conglomerate countries, uh, global uh, multinational companies, and in 1936, in the Summer Olympic Games, this is a good example of this. Fanta, that type of drink, which is owned by Coca-Cola, kind of originates during this time period of Nazi um, Germany and then during World War II. To circumvent a trade embargo by the United States during World War II, the German market kind of works, and the, the Coca-Cola headquarters there in Germany works, to create a new drink called Fanta. And they put they kind of change the the drink in some ways but they are essentially working for coca-cola selling products to nazis and to nazi citizens the same people who um invoked death camps and concentration camps in europe um, they've lined the company's um, pockets of coca-cola through this and i think this is something that was uh it's pretty troubling to, to think of that. And it's the same things happen today. Of course they do and, and can. Um, companies are global corporations. And don't be uh, naive to think that the American government is not going to, in some ways, um, have the their policy, their governmental policies, suit and align with global transnational corporations that they want to do well in this economy real quickly this summarize here and finish up you can see a, a group of pictures here on the right is the berlin wall and then there's a guy at the bottom who's chiseling away at it this is when the wall is coming down and two east germans sitting up on top of the wall both with coca-colas in hand so that's what we had talked about earlier at the very top is russian coca-cola which was slow to catch on like we said pepsi was really uh, play, uh, that was really a place where Pepsi made inroads because uh, the idea that Coca-Cola and capitalism didn't mesh well with communist Russia. Only two countries today really do not sell Coca-Cola. North Korea, as you see pictured there on the map, the area here that has the white outline, this is a, a satellite image of the world at night. The northern part here of Korea North Korea has very few cities and very few lights. It kind of shows you the backward nature of North Korea, a communist country. Cuba is very similar. You'll see the picture in a second here. 
part of the reason that neither one of these places sell Coca-Cola is the government has stopped business dealings with it. And Coca-Cola claims that if you see Coca-Cola being sold in Cuba or North Korea, I don't know how you'd see that. Nobody can get into that place. But if you'd see it being sold there, it's being done through illegal third parties. Here's a good uh, slide of showing what Cuba is like. It's only 90 miles off the coast of Florida. Uh, you've got tremendous culture, a tremendous group of people there, but they're living under the throes of a communist dictatorship started by Fidel Castro. And this is the southern tip of Florida here. And there's Haiti, uh, just 90 miles away. Yet they don't have a lot of the things that Americans have and enjoy. Their cars are all like from like the 1950s. There's a ton of them. There's a couple modern cars there, but very few of them. Uh, a tiny little island, but known for its its great baseball, its music, and um, it's the flavor of Cuba. I always feel like it's such a shame that people aren't able to go there and trade, and and that Cuba hasn't been able to open up. But uh, that's one of the last throws of communism in the world. And North Korea is another example. You see some statistics here. It's a military state. And you can tell that by every one of these statistics, especially um, things like uh, GDP, which is gross domestic product. In South Korea, which is booming economically, 32400 And in North Korea, GDP per person, 1800 So their economic might is tiny. There was a big scare recently with the, the missiles in North Korea. To me, they can't even keep the lights on there. They have so many people starving because they can't feed their own people. It's, it's pretty bad. Infant mortality rate is terrible in North Korea. Active duty members, though, this kind of shows you what the state is like in North Korea. 1.1 million North Koreans are in the military. Only 0.65 in South Korea. It just gives you an idea of what... It is like in North Korea and why Coca-Cola probably isn't being sold there. Uh, just look at the map here. It's a good way to be thinking about maps and how this compares. But there's North Korea here on the left side and South Korea just below it. There's Japan, a very industrialized Japan to the right. Just look at those three places and think about it. How do they compare? How does North Korea compare to South Korea? What jumps off the map there at you? There's not as many cities, not even close. How does North Korea and South Korea compare to Japan? There are uh, much more populated, more densely populated places and cities here across the islands of Japan compared to both. So just an example there of how we'll look at maps and, and read those. A couple more slides here. Globalization in a bottle. Is globalization a new form of imperialism? You see the Coca-Cola consumption there and the fact that uh, it's being spread from places like Gambia at the top there to um, India, Pakistan, and other places around the globe. It Coca-Cola is something that you could get like a McDonald's, very similar. So these companies at the top here are global transnational companies that you will see all over the world in, in many cases, and Pepsi is one of those as well. So a billion hours ago, human life appeared on Earth. A billion minutes ago, Christianity emerged. A billion seconds ago, the Beatles changed music. A billion Coca-Colas ago was yesterday morning. That's a great quote to kind of summarize like where this is at. They sell a lot of Coca-Colas. Freedom, America, capitalism, globalism, and Coca-Cola going kind of hand in hand. Quickly to summarize this, in the 20th century, this biggest drink, Coca-Cola, corresponds with the rise of the United States as a global superpower and the triumph of capitalism over communism in the Cold War. Um, definitely things you should be thinking about when you're returning back to school. I'll leave you with a couple of ads here for Coca-Cola. This one's from the Super Bowl called Borders. Pretty interesting.
and this ad just to show you the international flavor of things from Taiwan called the pickup. Lastly, make sure you understand these questions and feel pretty comfortable with them as you're heading back to school here for the first week. There's one more video left that it should be pretty short. This is probably the longest one we've done. This will definitely be the shortest. And it's the epilogue to the book, which is only a few pages, but it is about water. And since it's the drink that's most important today and going forward into our future, I think we ought to spend a little bit of time on it. So I'll be back next time with that. Until next time, thanks for being here, and don't forget to be awesome.